Hello. So this is kind of a review and kind of not because the thing that uh, inspired this video is something that you pretty much can't get your hands on anymore. You either have one of these already or you might try your luck on eBay. Although I wouldn't recommend it because the people who have these in any sort of quantity are totally scalping these things. You're gonna face a ridiculous markup. I know I did. So anyway, what we have here are two generations of Craftsman Next Tech. Just kind of clever there. They uh, took the T from Next and the T from tech, and they stuck them together. Next deck. <laughs> yeah, um, so a few years ago, I'm not sure exactly how many, Craftsman had this utterly brilliant idea. I mean, they, it wasn't like they were the first to ever think about this, but um, create a 12 volt battery, lithium battery for you know, portable handheld tools like this. And they did something a million times cooler than that. They created a whole line of Next Tech devices. And every single one of them used this same die hard 12 volt lithium battery. Which is like the coolest thing ever. Let me show you. I also have a G2 version of the next tech um, what is this a jigsaw I think they call it yeah jigsaw um, I've used all these tools now for quite a while and I'm very satisfied the only problem is craftsmen for whatever reason you know they were going through this uh, financial crisis slash reorganization and they basically axed the whole next tech line and they had they had everything they had um all sorts of cool shit they had multi tools they had vacuums they had uh work lights um jigsaw uh let me see what kind of saws um yeah anyway just a whole bunch of cool power tools all using this 12 volt battery uh, in addition to that, they had cool accessories too. They had a, um, they have a hybrid version of this battery that has an LED work light built into the bottom. Unfortunately, it has some kind of a parasitic power drain problem, so even when the light's not on, the battery goes dead. A lot of people have complained about that. I'm still contemplating trying to get a hold of one because I just think it's such a cool idea even if the battery goes dead. Um, Let's see what else. Oh yeah, they had a um, one of these that had a, a, a cigarette uh, lighter car interface on the other side, so you could take any device that you'd normally plug into your car's cigarette lighter and plug it into the battery, and then you could power that device for however many amp hours the battery lasted for. Another super freaking cool innovation. And uh, I'd say out of all the things that Craftsman is probably best at nowadays, given that they're not what they used to be in sort of the golden age of American tool manufacturing innovation slash industrialism, is innovation. Because even to this day, Craftsman is still creating all these really cool innovative things, although some of them are not necessarily all that great. Let me show you a couple things. I got this Craftsman stapler. This is pretty cool. You're just like, uh, it's reversed, right? A normal staple gun, which I happen to have, is like this. And uh, so you're putting the weight on the, the back of your hand, which actually it doesn't give you the best leverage, even though it's somewhat intuitive. So anyway, this actually flips it around, 
gives you a lot more stability and strength. It's like one of those grippers. So yeah, you get you get a lot better control. And in addition, you can put like three different types of fastener fasteners in here. So there's just an example of a uh, how Craftsman still kind of leads the market in innovation. Let's see, I have one more really weird Craftsman thing I wanted to show off here. Now this came in a set. Um, very innovative, bizarre, uh, adjustable wrench design that's just super cool. Like they fold up so they're nice and portable and then uh, they have different positions that they can lock in which is cool. Like here's one position, here's another. I know this seems like a Craftsman commercial and I'm, I'm kind of sorry about that. Uh, I don't have any like Craftsman stock. I've never received any payments from the company. I bought all these tools with my own money but I've been a fan for a long time as a lot of American males are who screw around with tools just because of Craftsman le Craftsman's legacy mostly not necessarily their newer Chinese stuff but uh yeah so this is another kind of cool thing and it really does sort of work but it's a bit janky so they discontinued these as well um, one more thing in here let's see where did I put that something that's really kind of interesting find it. Yeah, here's here's the other size. There's a big one too. So you can see I I put a little white crayon in here to m create vis more visibility with the um, range, but you can see they have a big one too. And I, I think one thing that's really uh, great to point out with this is the technique that they used for the construction it, it uses laminated sheets that are then riveted together a very very strong laminar structure very innovative you can actually get a lot more strength using this technique with the layering as opposed to just a solid piece of you know steel which uh, the crystalline structure can create some serious flaws in forging, but if you have layers like this, you uh, are sort of mitigating some of those flaws. So uh, I might have to dump out my tools to find what I really wanted to show off here. Something that I was drooling over for months and months and months, and it was so damn expensive. And then finally, uh, they were liquidating at my local Sears outlet and I picked this up on a 50% off sale which I've been wanting one of these forever so it's an adjustable wrench and I don't think I'm not even sure Craftsman's the first company to come out with these I think some other company might have come out with them first and then Craftsman either licensed or just outright ripped off the <laughs> design but this is so freaking cool this little piece right here this is a unique Craftsman Innovation. Honestly, I don't know how useful it is because I haven't gotten a chance to use this wrench much. But, uh, yeah, so here's the deal like, it's got like a worm drive or something in here. And you just slide this up and down. It takes like half the time to adjust. And it's a little more, um, uh, what am I thinking? Less time to adjust and it kind of holds a bit better because I think because it's not just a big fat worm drive on the side like uh let's see where's my other wrench? Yeah like this. Here's a cheap Chinese piece of crap that I got from Master Mechanic. And this big fat worm drive, uh it's got a little bit of play. I actually have one of these at work that I use that's a lot less reliable. I actually had to do a whole bunch of cleanup on this to get it to have such a smooth action. So they just don't make tools like they used to. It's like nobody really checks them out. Some design, they go, it's like with video, you know, and stuff goes OVA, or not OVA, um, 
maybe that is OVA, but like direct to video instead of going to the theater. Well, it's like nowadays with tools, things just go directly to the stores without a lot of oversight or, you know, somebody who's really knows what the hell they're doing and is going to use the tools and test them out, uh, checking them off and doing QC. So you end up with these janky mechanisms that are half-baked. This works well enough, but it has a little more complexity in there than is necessary. The nice thing about it is a really clear laser etching on the whatever this is called, and uh, this one does too, and it's also it's also nice and legible, so yeah, that's pretty standard nowadays. But yeah, you can see how much longer this takes, and it doesn't take a genius to figure out how much easier to use this is. So yeah, here's a few of my craftsman treasures. Uh, I actually have a whole socket set that I got a, at a thrift shop, a vintage hardened stainless steel uh, craftsman sockets that are just like totally freaking awesome. That was one of the things that kind of sold me on craftsman. Of course, one of my prized tools, which I have somewhere in my over here well, that could be anywhere at this point my tools kind of float around <laughs> I'm sure I'm gonna get a bunch of thumbs down for this <laughs> yeah sorry I can't find it but uh, I have like a number two uh, Craftsman Phillips screwdriver that I've been using since I was like, I don't know, 10 years old, probably 8 years old. So that's like just a testament to the Craftsman legacy and the, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about, although it's kind of tangential to this. Um, yeah, so this isn't a review so much as it is kind of just like a question, like why? craftsman why you know what happened I mean obviously companies have financial problems and uh, geopolitics and globalization has changed everything so much um, I used this for the first time today on a actual construction project at work and uh, it worked great uh, more a little more power than Generation 1. Uh, for, for this point onward in the video, I'm just going to refer to this one on the right as G1 and this one is G2. And that's actually from the technical spec. But as I continue to talk and prattle on in this video, um, you're going to get a clearer and clearer picture of like the point I'm trying to get at, hopefully, and just sort of where I'm going with this whole thing. Cause Old details that you notice even hours after but yeah this is one of those abstract nebulous kind of discussions where things aren't immediately clear but they do get clear as time goes on uh, so yeah just first I want to go over the basic design uh, elements here and that will create new uh, discussion elements as well but um so first of all, I just want to ask, like, have you ever lusted after a tool and maybe bought it, and then a year later, however longer later, they come out with a new and improved version, a G2, if you will, and you're like looking at it and you're like, God damn, I really wanted this, I really wanted this battery meter, which is so cool. Uh-oh, battery boy. So yeah, that was pretty cool. You got to see it working in action. Normally it's green, and then it turns yellow when your battery's getting low, and then it turns red when your battery's all the way down. And that's actually how you can tell if a Craftsman Next Tech is a G2 or not. See, this one has a battery meter as well, so it's a G2. Um, and I think they're still producing these, although I'm not sure. They probably discontinued the whole line by now. But yeah, anyway, back back to what I was saying, like, 
you see that new version of the tool and you're like, yeah, this, this was a great idea, now I need to buy the updated version. I mean, that's more common with like mobile phones and stuff, uh, but not so much power tools. However, it does still occur, and sometimes, yeah, I just want to point out, this is a lot more common with modern space age technology like mobile phones or whatever. It's like every year you gotta have the new 2.0 whatever version that has the new this or that, the higher resolution camera. Power tools are a little more timeless in the sense that the capacity to improve them exponentially is not near anywhere near as uh, expansive as mobile phones which are still like a growth uh, innovation sort of thing but um what I was getting at with that whole thing was like you see the new feature and then you kinda ask yourself like okay first of all like why didn't they include this new feature in the original and secondly like so they added a new feature but they have also made other changes where perhaps they took away things that were in the original. Like for example, here's a perfect example, on G1 in the rubber rubberized grip they have these little ridges here to increase friction and on the G2 no ridges although they, they do have this line which I guess this one has that too. Also I want to point out this is really cool there's a texture here and you can feel it. It's like a real texture like it 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 increases friction dramatically this one is like slippery or practically like it's still rubber but compared to this it's just a night and day so you have to ask yourself like yeah I'm getting the new version but what am I losing like I'm gaining a new feature but I'm losing an old feature and it's like a opportunity cost I don't know if that's the right term but like basically you uh have to decide if the new features that are have been added outweigh the loss of the original features and the real thing that I'm getting at here is like if you're an industrial designer and you're making a product and your job is to create the G2 and you maybe like obviously in a big corporation like Craftsman there's probably teams and maybe the team that works on G2 has never even seen G1 before and they're just given this job and told to make it better or whatever. In the best case scenario there's like some sort of feedback where people who are actually using the tools like send in comments and are like well I didn't really like the way the gear uh, you know the high speed low switch was operating on the G1 it was really kinda hard to push from this direction so if you could make it more like uniform so that it was as easy to switch from both sides then you know that'd be great and then they implement those changes however that's like a fantasy scenario more likely it's just like uh, someone from internal uh, hands off this job to a team and they're like make this G1 better so that we can sell more of these or whatever and and then they like the team looks at this and they're like hmm maybe this could be improved even though they don't really even know why the first team created the switch like this maybe they had a perfectly good rationale and maybe they pulled people and got their feedback so this is all like kind of fascinating really if you think about it the how products go from an idea to an actual design and what I really wanted to point out here, the thing that blows my mind, is how many utterly arbitrary aspects and elements there are to these designs. And you see this if you go into like a CVS or drugstore or whatever, and you see toothbrushes, and you notice that the toothbrushes all have these really weird designs, or you go into a shoe store and all the Nikes and the sneakers I'm making a video, dear, so if you could just be quiet, I'd appreciate it. So, like, um, all the shoes and stuff have these crazy, like, nonsensical ridges and swoops and geometry that is just pulled out of somebody's ass. It's like, oh, that's my aesthetic, you know, or whatever. It's not like 
there's a rationale behind it. So here's kind of an example of something that is an almost counterpoint to that, I would say. So like, here's vents, right? This is just exhaust, so the motor doesn't overheat and burn out while you're using the device for extended periods. So um, this one, the G1 has these three bars which uh, in my opinion is really attractive. They're kind of like gills. There's a certain uh, isometric quality to them. It gives it a very futuristic sleek look. But um, from what I've heard, the G1s tended to actually burn out sometimes from extended use. The brushes inside would overheat and melt and that would cause some real problems. Uh, this one they, they added a new, the G2, they added actually another exhaust port up here. First I thought it was a lanyard attachment, but then I was like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Even though it's light enough to like put it on a lanyard, why would you do that? Um, kind of interesting though that it does look very similar to a lanyard attachment like you find on many devices. Like, uh, check this out. I got this DeWalt, um laser measuring tape sick um, the other day and it's got this little lanyard loop ring here which is really cool because it can go to either side so you can flatten it up on the surface uh, but as you can see it's pretty similar it's just like a peg that goes through a little slot and this is basically the same thing it's just a little peg going through a slot you could use it as a lanyard I suppose if you really wanted to, not that you would, but um, yeah, so they dramatically changed this particular design <laughs> um, a lot more uh, portage here so that you get a lot more ventilation preventing that burnout. Um, however, if you just look at the aesthetics here, it's very arbitrary, like. They could have just added a whole bunch more gills, or they could have made the gills longer. I mean, yes, and that would have a ripple effect that would change the whole design. Um, but, yeah, so you've got to ask yourself, like, what goes through industrial designers' heads that cause them to make these design changes? And, like, why didn't they just build on the previous aesthetic? Since there are so many similarities, I mean... If you if you look study these really closely and I have it's clear that they reused a lot of the topology um, from probably CAD files you know for the manufacturing process a lot of it has been redone but a lot of it is also so similar that you just know that they were using like a a unified you know base obviously in a company they have all those files on a computer server somewhere so they can hand them off to the next group of engineers for the iterations but uh yeah okay so back to the sort of the quasi review side of of everything here's a really great improvement that I like uh, and you'll see why they did this in my trusty G1 here. Okay, you see these black numbers and dots on here that are totally worn off? In fact, if you go up to the top, this is the drill setting right here. You can almost faintly see it. It's still sort of there. There's a drill icon. This one actually, it's that same exact icon, although it's completely worn off on this one. On this one, it's still well, it's visible because it's brand new, but they actually put all these settings on a dedicated ring so that now it's like probably a lot less likely to just wear off and disappear. So that was an innovation that I could definitely appreciate. And now we go back to the sort of arbitrariness, although see these little ridges here in the topology that makes that kind of easy to turn. This one has the same exact, well no, they're slightly different. Yeah, this is kind of cool. This is something worth pointing out, I think. 
You notice like the roundedness of all these elements and this one's like a more geometric and angular. Um, you'll see that throughout the aesthetic of the whole revision. Like the ports are a good example, but here's one that I really find fascinating. Look at the uh, Craftsman label on there. Now look at the edges of the label. See how they're rounded? Now look at the label on this one. Square edges. I know this is probably seems like I'm super nerding out and stupid to a lot of people, but I just find that re really interesting that they change such a subtle detail and and it's a visible throughout the entire device. It's almost like there's two divisions that worked on this, like uh, sorry, I'm going to be a little sexist here for a moment, but like the women's division where they made it all curvaceous and sensual and rounded and like a retro ray gun from the 1940s or something, like Buck Rogers. And this one's all like, they were like, ah, forget that. Here's like the men's division. They're like, yeah, quarterbacks and football barbecue, uh, flag waving. So they made all these like angular tool thing, like try, like they're trying to compete with uh, DeWalt and all these other brands. They're just trying to mimic the aesthetic. In fact, you'll see this. You'll see this uh, particular geometry on almost all modern drill driver heads. I have a Dewalt that's like that. This round one is just very atypical. You like never see rounded chucks like this on mainstream devices. But I always kind of liked it. I thought that added a nice sort of wholeness to the whole thing. Like it just, it really does look cool. Uh, I remember one uh, student I worked with was like, that looks like a ray gun or something like that. And I was like, yeah, it does look like a ray gun. It's cool. And this one, on the other hand, just looks pretty generic. It's like, oh, this could be anybody's drill driver. It doesn't really have a lot of unique personality. Although it just does still have these cool little minor innovative features. So this is why I need to get tools like this and knock them because I knock them over all the time and so they need to be able to withstand the abuse uh yeah okay so moving on this is a little bit easier to use than the sloped one I think just because it's a sort of isometric barrel and although this one right here has this uh what I think is an improved texture that actually makes it easier to to rotate manually without spinning um, so there's a little fine detail where we're back to that like you lose some things you gain others and vice versa uh, okay the construction this uh, this is the biggest part and it's a subtle like out of all the features that they changed this is the one that means the most to me and it it's something that is almost unnoticeable to a lot of people I think look at Look at this f face on. What do you see, like, around the edges? There's something really prominent. There's four screws, right? So they designed this to come apart so that the whole, like, gearbox and all that can just slip out of the main driver assembly, which uh, I think is a cool way to do it and probably increases repairability. By quite a bit however this one totally different and really fascinating to me it's so streamlined like they have these things almost like where the screws used to be which is kind of interesting however the whole device now is just like a clamshell so you've got all the screws are on one side which you know would make uh, mass production a lot easier because you don't have to rotate it when you're assembling and disassembling. However, I think it probably has made the gear box motor chuck and all that uh, harder to repair. Perhaps. I'm just speculating. There's also this minute gap around here where like debris and liquid and God knows what could get in there and screw things up. This one, it has a gap but it's not an internal gap. It's a 
lateral gap, I guess you could say. So probably more resilient. So that's kind of a, an interesting detail. You know, what really irks me is like, when people buy shit normally, they never, ever, in a million years, analyze designs of mass-produced items to this level. What I'm doing right now, I'm going to come right out and say it, because I'm not um, ashamed of it, is like massively nerding out. It is like super anal. It's crazy. It's crazy. I get it. I know it's crazy. Um, but it's not wrong either. And <laughs> and honestly, like if, if everyone analyzed designs to this level, We'd be living in a world where things were a lot more, um, a lot higher quality, frankly. Um, because people would be making far more informed decisions, they'd be far more critical, they wouldn't be, like, giving uh, corporations all these free rides and being like, well, this thing is good enough. They would be like, no, it's not good enough. It, it has these flaws, and they could list them off. So I feel like, as a general philosophy, um, it's a it's a good policy to really analyze designs like thoroughly and not just a superficial kind of thing. Although with power tools, and here's where I have to admit I'm kind of ignorant myself. The it's the internals that are really important, like the external packages is a bonus and the aesthetics are are pleasing however it's the it's the guts that are really crucial in power tools um, and as far as the electric motor in here and the gearbox and the or whatever they use and the chuck I am completely ignorant I'm just like with cars I have no idea what's going on underneath that hood so all I can see is the pretty exterior. However, there's a lot of things to uh, pick apart on just from the external viewpoint. Um, so back to the review. Uh, the light. It is brighter, and I've heard this in other commentaries. But you can actually see it in the video, which is kind of cool. Definitely brighter. Let's see if I can do like a little flashlight comparison. Yeah, look at that. It's like twice as bright. Well, I don't know. Almost twice as bright. So yeah, that's a definite bonus. I can't think of any downside to that change. They even extended the clear plastic thing quite a bit. Triggers. I love this trigger. This is actually one of the reasons I bought this originally. I just felt like the trigger was the most ergonomic. Oh yeah, this is cool. So this one, no matter how sensitive you are with that trigger, you can never get the light to come on before without the motor. This one, look at that. You can use it like a flashlight without even getting the motor turned on. So that's also a cool feature. Um, God, what was I even saying? Oh yeah, the trigger. This is like the most ergonomic driver trigger I have ever touched in my life. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It looks... It's like the dream trigger. I mean, you can't beat that. It's perfect. Um, the switching, um, the direction switching switch. Very, um, easy to use on G1. Also easy to use on G2. Now this is a really a thing that annoyed the hell out of me when I first um, got this, but it has a neutral locking position. Oh, that's kind of cool. Okay, I didn't know you could do that. Learn something new every day. This one, I guess this one works too. So you put it in the neutral locking position and you can't pull the trigger down at all. You actually have to switch it into a direction where you can use it. So that's kind of interesting. The geometry of the switch is cool because you know they're really smart. They put a little chamfer on this edge because that's where your thumb pushes down when you're pushing. It gives you a little more leverage and doesn't cause it to like dig painfully into your finger. That's a great touch. 
And then here's the curious thing. The direction directional arrow is not infilled with any kind of paint. It's just plain. This one has white paint. Uh, just, yeah, it's a little harder to push in because it doesn't have that chamfer. But at the same time, like, you end up using your side of your thumb to give you less leverage. But um, ultimately kind of a, just a quality of life adjustment that is just it makes me really happy when companies put in these incredibly fine details that really shows that whoever designed this put a lot of thought into it and and care you know they were like we want to make this not only easy to use but a pleasure to use that's literally what what a design adjustment like that means to me um, these stick out a little bit more and I think that's mainly because of the chamfer. But, um, yeah, more or less satisfactory. Uh, same exact chuck size. Uh, okay, here's a feature that I wanted so badly in the first version because I had all sorts of plans to, like, fix a target level onto the back of my driver. A lot of expensive drivers actually have built-in levels so you don't have to you know screw around with something like that but I thought oh what the hell I'll just put a target level on the back and then I can drive straighter screws into flat surfaces so in this one they actually flattened off the back of it well it doesn't really stand up because the anyway I don't know why I was trying to stand it up but it's flat. <laughs> this one is not. This one is really weird and it actually, well, it adds to that sort of like curvy aesthetic bef that I mentioned before. However, I really prefer this design. Having the flat surface means I can stick a target level on the back of there and you can tell just by looking that it's perfectly uh, parallel to the plane of the chuck, which is very nice. Um, did I mention this already? I don't think I did, but um, the high-low switch is reversed. This is so curious to me. So, like, when this one's in low, this one's high. They go, <laughs> they go low, we go high. No, sorry, I couldn't help it. Um, so, yeah, that's a little unintuitive. However, since it's just a um, uh, a power um, differential rather than a speed differential, it doesn't really matter much to me. Like, here, listen to this. This is high speed. This is low speed. The tone's exactly the same. That's because it is exactly the same. It's just a, a more torque right so yeah um as for the topology of the switch this was a great move like i honestly had no idea why they designed the switch like this with an incline here it just ugh, it doesn't work it doesn't work like i would often flip my to change uh speeds i would flip my hand around like this and pop this up and it always just felt kind of slippery and I was worried about it. With this one, um, let's see how easy it is. I haven't actually done it yet. So like, just flip my thumb up there. Oh yeah, much easier. And let's see. Yeah, I can do it in both directions, one-handed, fairly easy. <laughs> I'm gonna break this thing before the video is done. You watch. So yeah, I can't even flip this back, mainly because it doesn't stick out enough. Like. Oh yeah, here we go. This is this is important. So this is level, right? The sur top surface of the tool level, not this one. It goes down. It's in a little ravine here. So yeah, you can get your finger in there no problem. Easily switch that back and forth. This one, good luck. There's nothing there. It's just your finger slides right over the top like it's a tiny little lip. Um, here's my favorite and I think funniest design 
choice that just makes me scratch my head. So, silver paint, black arrow. <laughs> black paint, or black rubber, white arrow. Like, okay, it looks kind of cool that they're reversed, but was there really a point to that? I mean, obviously it was sort of to go with the black and the white of the ring, which admittedly is higher visibility for those usability folks out there. I hate the word folks, sorry. I, I should have never used that. I mean, usability people out there, um, everybody who's anybody in the design world knows that if you're doing markings or readouts for high visibility, always put white text on a black background. That's a no-brainer. Better at low lighting, better in highlighting, it's just better. So yeah, so that was a good choice on their part to switch these around. We already saw that the markings completely wore off along with the silver paint on this plastic. It's probably some kind of industrial grade nylon, I don't know what the hell they make these out of. Okay, so this is also kind of funny. And once again we go back to the whole like arbitrariness of the whole thing like design group A versus design group B like look at the grips on this and look at the grips on this like this uh, really logical and the way they textured textured it ev pretty much everywhere your hand is touching brilliant like whoever designed this they knew how the human hand was going to fit around this device. G2 still basically uh, working, although if you'll notice, and this is subtle, but pretty cool. See how this uh, curves? Sorry, the light's kind of fading on me here. How this curves inward so that when your fingers wrap around, the middle finger, which extends beyond the others, is going into this little bend here. Brilliant. So intelligent. This one doesn't have that. It's straight. It's flat because my well, aesthetics and <laughs> doing the geometry, right? Though the sharp edges. This one has a sort of sharp edge here too, but it's rounded as well. This one a lot sharper. And like this back edge here, totally sharp. This one much more rounded. So yeah, there's a loss there. Like, my finger's touching the gray plastic. It's not on the rubber there. And uh, the loss of the texture also significant to me because it's just not as good of a grip. So you do lose things when you sacrifice good design choices on the altar of aesthetics. And arbitrarily, that's the important thing to point out. Like, these desi design decisions were just for flair. They weren't like, they didn't have a good reason. See, this one, they had good reasons. These were good reasons. These were reason well-reasoned design choices. This one, it was just like, yeah, let's put some cool-looking lines that make it look all fancy and futuristic. Like, that was literally what they were thinking it's just like when you go into a shoe store and there's like all these swoops and ripples and bars of color it's like that doesn't make the shoe better it just makes it more interesting to look at not really appropriate for power tools um and i would argue not really appropriate period for anything uh that isn't purely a non-functional piece of artwork um, here's something that, uh, only the most hardcore people will even notice. Uh, these screws, notice how they're not black. Yeah, those are stainless steel, baby. Oh, scary fun. Uh, just a sec. Hello? Hey. Doing, doing good. I'm, I'm in the middle of a, a video though, so I'm gonna have to call you back. Yeah, sorry, I, uh, I worked too late, so I just didn't have the energy.
Love you too. Bye. Yeah, so, um, where was I? Oh, right, the screws. Stainless steel. These are the default screws that come with the device, and I'll tell you what, these are coated, so they wouldn't have rusted anyway, but one thing bothers me more than anything is not being able to repair my devices, and uh, often repairs will be inhibited by screws that have either stripped or corroded, so I actually replaced the screws the stock screws on this with stainless steel. Ridiculous minor detail, but I thought I would point it out because this uh, G1 actually had black screws like this in the beginning, so that I did alter the aesthetic a little with these uh, shiny stainless steel screws, which honestly I think look a lot better. They are more expensive though, so that's why they don't usually use them in uh, devices like this. Um, Okay, what else? God, I'm actually out of things to talk about. That would be truly bizarre. Wow, I think I am. In like a lion out like a lamb. Yeah, so... G1 and G2. You want to know why I have two drivers? I didn't do this arbitrarily. Anybody who really knows what the hell they're doing in construction will have two drivers because one you will have a countersinking drill bit and the other will have your you know driver bit so that way you drill your countersinking hole so you don't have splitting or anything like that and then you drive it in with your other driver it saves a ton of time if you got two so that you don't have to switch bits even with a, a quick uh, change whatever the hell these are called head things like I have I have it on one because I switch different fastener drivers a lot but <sighs> I gotta take a deep breath here um, yeah anyway it's so much faster if you have two drivers it seems kind of wasteful and unintuitive but honestly it things just go so much faster I don't even know how to describe how much faster they go a lot faster so yeah, that's a little pro tip from uh, Neotoy. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, yeah, so I guess there is a little bit more to say. And those who aren't interested in like philosophy or anything like that should probably go somewhere else right now. But to me, this whole video and these two devices are just a jumping off point really for a larger discussion which is all about design decisions, industrial design, like why do designers do certain things, why it is our system of mass production and industrialization uh, create these artifacts um, why does it allow them to happen when there's so many options for you know alternatives and uh, why doesn't functionality trump aesthetics and we live in a world that's dominated by image where so much is sacrificed for image but in reality a world of substance is is what we need it's it's what sustains us. Um, so, yeah, okay, craftsmen. Globalization, uh, China, third world labor, it's ruined so much. I don't mean to sound like an asshole or a Debbie Downer or whatever the hell, but it's so true. It's like, and then we're back to the opportunity cost thing. Like, what do you... What do you lose um, for what you think you're going to gain? Like, the more I think about it, I feel like we've lost so much and we can never really get it back. And society made that choice collectively by supporting companies economically when they were doing these questionable things when they were transitioning over to this new way of 
fulfilling consumer demand and it's like we made that happen you know with our money and now we're paying the consequences like things are just good enough they're not really exceptional anymore because like yeah you buy a cheap driver like this was fifty dollars when I bought it fifty bucks like that's outrageous I mean, if you think about the technology and the power, the agency that this device represents, you can build a freaking house with a $50 piece of hardware. It's mind-boggling. And this might last 10 years, maybe, if I treat it right. Um... And yet I've got Craftsman tools much more simple than this. You know, that my dad gave to me from his dad that are like, what, 80 years old now? I don't know, they're hella old. And they're still going, and guess what? I'll be handing them down to my cat when I die. <laughs> At the ripe old age of 75. No, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Yeah, so... There's something to be said for that whole exchange, and it's, now we come back to aesthetics again. It's like the aesthetics of living. Do you choose to live a life where good enough is good enough, and you're surrounded by tools that cost $50 and get the job done, or do you want to be surrounded by beautiful heirloom tools that you can pass down to your cat or whatever, and, like, Honestly, I know which one I would choose if I had the choice, but civilization has a way of, like, taking those things away from us. Slowly, gradually, we barely even notice. They're like craftsmen, seers, a monolithic, amazing company, an American icon, and just like every other company in the world now, American companies included... Except for a few, you know, forced, not forced. Well, yeah, I would say forced by economic forces to buy um, all their mass-produced uh, components from Chinese factories, Indian factories, you know, wherever the labor laws are lax enough to lower the margins to... Uh, unforeseen levels fifty dollars for a tool that um let's say a hundred years ago maybe that's too far eighty years ago let's try eighty years ago eighty years ago might have cost you know three hundred dollars well they wouldn't even have the technology to build this eighty years ago not to this degree of sophistication but if they if they did just the materials alone hundreds if not thousands of dollars so yeah everyone can go down to their st the whatever store and buy one of these like the access there's the opportunity right that we've sacrificed quality for ubiquity and everybody has access to this now and maybe that's a good thing it's certainly I would say almost anyone would agree that it's better than having just a few really high quality tools that no one can afford floating around. So I don't know, it's like, it's a circular argument. I feel like uh, I argue for and against, and I can't really make up my mind. Here I am holding these tools in my hand, and it's like, yeah, I kind of already made my decision. I voted with my dollar. It's not like... I can take that back, and I use these on a regular basis, so, yeah, but it's sad to watch a company like Craftsman, like, like, what happened with the Next Tech line? Like, that innovation was created by the same spirit that propelled them into the 21st century as this amazing force of empowerment, and and yet at the same time, they're kind of like uh, scuppered as a ship, you know, because <laughs> they have to do what everyone else is doing. And they apparently couldn't afford to 
keep the division that was responsible for this next tech line going and they just were like well sorry guys we're gonna stick to you know whatever other segments of the business were doing better so like risks risky business you know it's not it's it doesn't look as a, uh what's the word companies are a lot less likely to invest in risks and you don't just see this in tools or hardware you see it in entertainment too like movies more and more sequels i read this article recently it was just like all about how like over 50 percent of all the new movies last year whatever were sequels to movies that had already they were franchises because guess what sequels are just piggybacking on the success of a previous movie and they get a lot more guaranteed uh, people coming to see those movies because people have already seen the previous movie and it made money so they're making a safe bet and because of that you know people go to the theater and they're like I already saw this movie because it was so much like the others and like hello yes you're the reason for that it's because you're only going and seeing the same movie over and over again because it's what you want to see and so the companies are just reacting to that economically it's an economic force it's the invisible hand your invisible hand is forcing the hand of these media companies to produce the same thing over and over again Re originality is a casualty is a a, you know the death of originality is a side effect of that process and it's the same with these tools 12 volt batteries genius so useful so versatile these are straight up um, these are non computerized you hook up a, a light in fact I did this the other day I hooked up a 12 volt neon light that I just stuck the bare wires in there and it lit up. You know how useful that is? You know how many devices in our world run on 12 volts? And to be able to just have a lithium battery with amp hours that you can plug into whatever the hell you want that you can rig yourself, that's the kind of power that is just it's amazing, honestly, to have that capability. And and to have the same battery work for all the tools so you don't need a separate charger for every freaking tool you have um, another amazing thing and guess what killed off by all that stuff I was talking about five minutes ago because people uh, can't take risks anymore because risks don't make money or they're a long game a long game you know it's not a short game it's not the quick and easy route, it's the long risky route and occasionally it flops and then heads roll but if you just go the safe and easy route then heads never roll and it's mediocrity all the way to uh, Armageddon and yeah that's not good that's not good for anybody that's like death of a salesman kinda territory and and I don't know, like, that's not the world I want to live in. <laughs> but clearly I'm paying the money to make that world a reality. So I don't know. What What do you guys think? What are your thoughts? I mean, craftsmen. Uh, you know, you want to make an appeal to, like, the company and be like, could you please... <laughs> you please go back to the way you were but like they can't I know they can't it's not economical and they're already like struggling enough as it is but if I had one wish for Craftsman it would be that they would like bring the next tech line back and expand upon it and stop screwing around with all these other tools offerings that they have because you know like you don't 4 volt 18 volt they've done this before it's like it, the voltage doesn't freaking matter. There's nothing special about it except for compatibility. And 12 volts is super compatible with so many other devices and platforms. Like, you have a huge range of devices you can power with 12 volts. But, like, how many devices can you think of that run on 18 volts? Not many. 
or 4 volts or whatever arbitrary, like, it's so dumb. You go into the hardware store and you see all the power tools and they, like, put it right on the front of the box like it's a big deal, like, 18 volts or 30 volts or whatever. It's like, the volts don't matter. The milliamp hours matter. It's not like you get more power. You know, the amp hours are what's important. Capacity. Because any voltage can drive any motor. It's just a matter of a control circuit and the amperage. But, um, yeah, that's a whole another ball of wax. But, uh, yeah, what do you think? I mean, I'm probably going to get, like, five views on this video like every other video I do. I don't even know why I post to YouTube anymore, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. How's life? How are you guys doing? What's up? It's been so long since I, like, talked to anybody on YouTube. Everybody left, because YouTube sucks now. But, you know, whatever. I can still make videos like this, and that's why I'm still on YouTube, so... <sighs> Enduring. Love you guys.